I'm glad that you were able to come and be my guest, and I really appreciate you taking the time out. Could you briefly go over uh, where you have come from, how you were, according to yourself, a former terrorist, and where you are today? Well, we don't choose how we're born. Even our names are given to us without our permission. You know, I grew up, I was born by an American mother and a Palestinian father. He was Jordanian. It was no such thing as Palestinian, uh, especially in the Judean areas. Up until 1967, the charter was changed. Then mm -hmm. you have, from my mother's side, her family was were connected with Winston Churchill, who wanted nothing but the destruction of Nazism. From my father's side, my, father's side my, fa my family was connected. My grandfather was friends with uh, Hajj Amin al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who wanted and collaborated with Hitler to destroy the Jews all over the Muslim world. And uh, you see pictures of him with, with Adolf Hitler on the eve of the final solution. Uh, so I grew up in the opposite, total opposite sides of this, you know, this, you know, this whole spectrum, you know. So my, from my mother's side, she was Christian. My father's side was Muslim. And I was right in the middle. So I had to listen to both sides. And I was young growing up. And I grew up in Israel. I, of course, took my father's side. When a child is born to a Muslim father, he's automatically Muslim. My birth certificate says father Muslim, mother Christian, child Muslim. So anybody who wants to argue the issue that Islam offers women's rights. Uh, may I challenge that question? <laughs> sure thing. I, well, I, I agree with you 100%. She had no, no right to put Christian child. So growing up Muslim in the Middle East, you know, in the, especially in the Palestinian areas, in the heart of the biblical land, mm -hmm. I breathed the air of the Middle East. I ended up, of course, building up my hatred towards the occupier, Israel. And I, you know, stoned and did all these things that others do, and ended up in prison, and later on ended up in a terror act, came to the States. In the States, I was active with the PLO, and then I became active with the Muslim Brotherhood. In 1993, my life took a turn, and I began to read the Bible, and I began to compare Islam with the biblical text. And I found that Islam was the antithesis of what the Bible proclaimed thousands of years ago. So I began to document the similarities and the differences between the two. And finally, it took me years to finally culminate in this God's war and terror, in which I wanted to basically make a compodium of the views between the Muslims and between the Christians on the end times, because this is a very hot topic these days. And you've seen, you know, CNN also you know, aired at one time, God's Warriors, mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. So it became a very interesting topic to me and to many others. And so I, I began to write about it. I have, you know, 500 pages in this book, and comparing the two intensively in how the Muslims view eschatology versus how the Christians view eschatology. And it's very interesting, because as you see Ahmed and Nijad speaking, you know, uh, praying for the ushering of the coming of the Mahdi. The Mahdi in Islam uh, is basically the Muslim Messiah, if you will. And the comparisons between the Mahdi of Islam and what the Bible calls the anti-Messiah, even from the Jewish perspective, you know, um, from the religious Jewish perspective, they still believe there is an anti-Messiah coming. Uh, he's called Arbilus by many Jewish uh, theologians. And the competitiveness between the two is immense. Uh, in Islam, the anti, uh, uh, the the Messiah or the Mahdi of Islam, he is known when he initiates what is called the seven-year peace treaty, which is the seven-year peace upon the earth. Which is exactly what the Bible says will happen as as the Antichrist will do. That is correct. And in the Bible it says he will break that peace treaty in the midst of it. In Islam, you have what is called the Hudna, and this is in fact what is going on in peace treaties between Israel and the PLO and this kind of thing. Syria and Israel, they will appease the religious sector by saying this is a Hudna. A Hudna in Islam is not a peace treaty, it's a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. What is called a peace treaty, but in Islam, a ceasefire is up to 10 years, and it must be broken prior to its uh, you know, commencement, finished before it finishes. The reason is because Islamic doctrine teaches that Islam must be propagated throughout the whole world, whether peaceful or militarily. So this will become contrary 
to the agenda of the Prophet of Islam in which he said, I have been ordered to fight all nations until they, they say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So when you make a peace contract with Islam, which as I have stated before in this program and my audience knows, that basically means is, is they don't have to uphold a peace contract with infidels, correct? The, the Quran teaches they just use it to their advantage, basically. Right, and the evidence to that is what we see. Look at the status quo of Oslo. Look at what Yasser Arafat did. He went to Johannesburg Mosque and said this is the peace treaty of al Hudaybiyah, which Muhammad broke the treaty with al Quraysh tribe. So this is very evident and very obvious. Mm -hmm. So we, we see the same thing in Annapolis, we see the same thing in Taqba, we see Sharm Sheikh, all these, all, all these treaties are broken. There is not a single treaty that is not broken. So, you know, it's futile to have that peace treaty. The Bible talks about the covenant with death, that God will make it null in the, in the, in the end, that Israel will commence in covenant with death. The question is, who does it commence this covenant with death with? What sure. nation does the Bible talk about? Mm -hmm. If you look at the biblical text, you will never find a single uh, name of any nation in the Bible that God in the end condemns for attacking Israel. You know, if you look at the burden against Tyre, the burden against Arabia, that kind of thing, Damascus, that kind of thing, you will never see a single nation that is not Muslim. All of them are Muslim. So the book examines Western concepts as well, or misconceptions, regarding the biblical narratives, in which they basically, in a lot of areas, missed the obvious, in which you see, in the context of many of the biblical narratives, when the battle is fought between the Messiah of the Bible, you will see that the Messiah is fighting nations that are Muslim. Uh, I can talk about, let's say, Habakkuk chapter 3. The Lord fights Midian. Now, all scholars agree that that's the Messiah, from the Christian perspective, that is. Mm -hmm. So, if the Messiah is fighting Midian, Midian is the brother of Ishmael, that is Arabia. And he fights Kushan, the tents of Kushan, or Kush, this is Sudan and Somaliland, the most fundamentalist countries in the Muslim world today. From the Islamic perspective, the prophecies that are mentioned by Muhammad regarding the end of times is that Muhammad clearly stated it in the Arabic, I can even quote it in the Arabic, لا تقوم الساعة حتى تغلب طائفة من المسلمين طائفة من اليهود قيل أين يا رسول الله قال في بيت المقدس وأتنا في بيت المقدس This means that the day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations and then the trees and the stones will cry out there's a Jew hiding behind me Come, O Muslim, come and kill him. What is I always ask my American audience, what part of kill do you not understand? <laughs> yes. And so what, it, what is in other words, it's, it's the final solution of the Jewish problem. In the biblical narrative, it's the final solution of the Islamist agenda. So it is totally the antithesis of what's in the Bible. So what's fascinating is really, is basically, and we'll get even more in depth into this, is basically when you look at the Muslim prophecies of end times, a lot of people don't even understand that Muslims have prophecies just like the Bible does. Uh, oh, yeah. And when you look at them, they actually match up with the exact same thing as what the Bible says, only they reverse who is good and who is evil. And, and in this way... Uh, their prophecies, they will be able to claim, have come true, and they could deceive the whole world, even though the Bible says the same thing, except for the Bible is talking about our own destruction, basically, uh, whereas Islam is talking about their victory. Exactly. All right, well, i got to take a break, and we're going to get more in-depth into that. I'm going to give you a chance to explain how this matches up, uh, how well, your theory on the Bible, a lot of people are aware of the beast, and I'd like to get into that and let you explain what this beast is and what you have found out. And uh, this will be really fascinating discussion. You are listening to your favorite weekend talk show in all of Metro Detroit. It is the Ben Armstrong Show with our special guest, Walid Shubat. He was a former terrorist, and he is converted to Christianity, and he has an insight that is unlike anybody else you've ever heard. That is why I am having him as my guest for you. And it is just a fascinating, fascinating discussion. Stick around. We'll be back right after this.